Hi guys, welcome back to another YouTube video. I'm your tutor, Disha. Today we'll be talking about reproductive biology. So if you're a Kate biology student, a CSEC biology student, a human and social biology student, or an integrated science student, you better stick around, watch, like, subscribe, and share with your peers. Stay tuned. Reproduction. Re production. Re means again, and production means making something. So putting that together, reproduction means making something again. So therefore, we could say that reproduction is a biological process in which offsprings are produced from parent or parents. And there are two types of reproduction. There's asexual reproduction and there's sexual reproduction. Now, asexual reproduction involves the production of an offspring from one parent. Of course, coming from one parent, that offspring is going to be identical. Makes sense, right? And there's sexual reproduction, which involves the fusion of the male sex cell with the female sex cell to produce an offspring that is not identical to the parents. Examples of asexual reproduction include budding, as the name suggests, a new offspring buds off the parent, cuttings, like cutting sugar canes and planting them again to generate a new offspring, runners, like strawberries and sweet potatoes, grafting, and lastly, tissue culture removing pieces of tissues like the leaves, the stems, the roots, and growing these tissues in cultures of nutrients to generate new plants. Now reproducing using only one parent or both parents can be very advantageous, but there are also some drawbacks to these. The advantages of sexual reproduction includes there's high genetic diversity because the offsprings that are being made are not identical to the parent. And that makes us genetically variable. <laughs> and because we are different, that also speeds up the evolution process. And the drawbacks to this is that if sexual reproduction, there is a lot of energy and time devoted in looking for a mate. Now, the good thing about asexual reproduction is that you don't have to do that because it only involves one parent. But on the contrary, with asexual reproduction, because it only involves one parent, there's no genetic variation. Let's look at sexual reproduction, starting with plants. The reproductive organ in plants is called the flower. Yes. The flower has male parts and female parts. In fact, the male part of the flower is called the stamen. Men. Male part. And the stamen consists of the antha and the filament. The antha makes the male sex cell, which is the pollen grains, and the filament supports the antha. The female part of the flower is called the carpel, a.k.a. pistil. And the pistil consists of the stigma, where the pollen grains will land, style, which connects the stigma to the ovary, and the ovule. Now let's get to the meat of the matter to see how the actual process of sexual reproduction in plants work. Okay, it was getting a little bit dark in here, and I decided to turn on the light. So whatever. Now the process of sexual reproduction in plants begins with pollination. And pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther 
to the stigma. So if pollen grains are transferred from the anther of one flower to the stigma of that same flower, we say it's self-pollination. And if pollen grains are transferred from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower on another plant, we say that's cross-pollination. How is the process of pollination achieved? That's right. We need agents. Hello, is this the Pollination Transportation Agency? I'm looking for an agent to carry pollen from my flower to another flower. The agents of pollination includes wind, insect, birds, water, and even bats. And guess what? flowers and pollen grains these agents transport are well adapted to the process in fact pollen grains that are transported by the wind are small light and dry pollen grains that are transported by insects are sticky and their flowers are brightly colored flowers that are pollinated by birds are brightly colored and have nectar what happens after these agents have succeeded successfully transferred pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. When pollen grains land on the stigma, just like a seed, it's going to absorb water and sucrose to liberate a pollen tube which will grow down the style to the ovary. It's going to enter the micropyle and fuse with the egg. And CSEC students, what is that process called? That's right, fertilization. Now, Cape biology students, pay attention to this. This ovule here is enlarged here. And when the pollen tube grows down to the ovary, the pollen grain, which contains two cells, a pollen tube cell and a generative cell, it's going to enter through the micropyle. One of those cell, which is haploid, is going to fuse with the egg, which is also haploid, to form a zygote. Now, the next pollen cell is going to fuse with the polar nuclei. The polar nuclei is diploid. When the pollen cell fuses with the polar nuclei, it's going to form a triploid endosperm. And the endosperm is going to later provide nourishment for the developing embryo. And we call this process double fertilization. Later on, the ovary will become the fruit and the ovule will become the seed. Thanks for watching, guys. And you better stick around because next time we're going to be talking about sexual reproduction in animals. Take care.